I hope you noticed that the cross of Christ in every cell is leaning forward to you and to me and to us. And I just want to invite you to, to pick out a party, part of your body. Don't be awkward about it or whatever, but every cell of everything that you see is held together by something Jesus created before the foundation of the world for you and for me. So today, I want to talk to you about how your habits shape your life and how ultimately the way that you use your body with your habits is going to be the thing that forms your destiny. And so today, I want you to notice, first of all, the, the urgency of this message. This is, this is it's about your body, and it, it's, it's about urgency, and it's, it's something that Paul's scripture actually can just leap out of the pages to tell us, and if you'll pay attention with me, I want you to, to see this first scripture. It's, it's about your body. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Notice that he switches from third person, from multiples, just back to one. You cannot do this for your spouse. You cannot do this for your kids. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. You alone can present your body as a living sacrifice. Somebody else can't do it for you which is your spiritual worship. The way that you use your body is a way that you worship according to the Bible. And I wish you could see this, just keep that scripture up there where the word appeal is there. And other translations are words like these. I urge you. Another translation, I beg of you. Another translation, I beseech you. That's King James for do this. <laughs> and if Paul had the ability to write down in the language of that day, an exclamation point. We have exclamation points in English language, but they used Greek back at that time, and he didn't have an exclamation point. Here's what he would be saying. I beg you. I urge you. I appeal to you. I'm beseeching you. The King James, I'm beseeching you. By the mercies of God, because he's been so merciful to give your body to him, and this thing right here, by the way, for those of you that are guests, and if you're a guest with us today, please make sure to let us know you're a guest. We got a gift for you. The QR code works for that, that thing too. And, but, but this is not a casket. This is not a casket. This is actually a baptistry. This, this is a place where people go in to show that my life is dead and I've now followed Christ. It is the way biblically that we go public. Biblically, there was no Facebook or Instagram. Hey, I became a Christian today. This is the way you do it. And so Next week and the next week and as many weeks as God continues to give us people that are going to come, we're going to offer them. But we wanted you to see this living illustration today. This is a starting point. This is something that many people have delayed all their lives doing for all kinds of reasons and a lot of times surrounded by pride. A man named Vance Havner was an old Baptist preacher. He's this guy that never learned to drive. He always had people drive him when he went to preach places. And he kind of talked like this. He talked through his nose. And he said, the problem with being a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. And that's true, right? But when we lay our lives down, it's kind of like, yeah, but this got tough. And I'm good, right? No, God wants us to lay our down our lives every day for him because he has connected us all together with him. And then all of us together as a body, and more about that next week. And then... Secondly, it's about your body connected to your mind. You see, we have a body and we have a mind and we have a soul, we have a spirit, we have all those things and they're all encapsulated in this container where we, we walk around and it's important for us to understand that, that the mind is connected to the body. Some of you are going like, man, I thought we did the scripture back in January. Yes, we did, but now we're looking at it through a different lens because our mind tells our body what to do and our mind tells our body what to do with the habits that we formed and, and we all have habits. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, or what is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? He's saying, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a guy named James or J.B. Phillips who wrote a translation of the New Testament back in like the 30s and 40s, and it's only a translation of the New Testament. There's not an Old Testament, but here's my favorite. He says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, 
but instead remold your minds according to what Christ has for you and for me. Now, here's the deal. All of us have certain things we've been molded into following, all right? And we have just naturally are that way, right? Uh, do we have any NC State fans here today that we're happy? Okay, we have a few. They've got their hands up high today. They haven't for years past, but their hands are high up today. All right, here we go, right? So, so there's, for some reason, somebody went there, you went there yourself, you like the colors or whatever, you decided years ago you were going to be a state fan, right? And so you're really happy. And so you're excited that you're getting to go to the dance, right? Now, how many of you people are Carolina fans out there, right? So, see, see, look at you. You're faithful. You still got your arms up and everything. You're excited about that. You're loud and proud like all Carolina fans are anyway. Um, but you, you followed into that mold. That's one of the molds in your life. That's one of the things where your mind affects your body so that when they score, you go, ah, and the other team scores, you go, ah, uh, or whatever, right? How, how many of you are Duke fans, right? So God bless you. Thank goodness. You're probably not going to see him play more this year, but you love him. That's pretty good, all right? You've made it a habit to love your team. You've made it a habit to brush your teeth, hopefully, if you haven't, the people besides you know. <laughs> How many of you brush your teeth with your right hand? All right, very good. How many of you comb your hair with your right hand? It's funny, some of y'all stick up your left hand to put your right hand. It's funny, right? Well, I guess so, right? You're right-handed, right? How many of you are left-handed? You brush your teeth? Okay, we got a bunch of those. You're the minority, but God bless you. That's wonderful. Just don't sit next to them if you're right-handed because they'll hurt you. <laughs> and you might hurt their, by their right hand as well, too. That's a habit. You're, there's something unconscious in your body that says, you use this hand to do this or to do this or to do this, right? But there are also conscious habits that we can develop and, and only you can develop them. You can love the person you're sitting beside and you can clap and cheer for them and you can say, I love you and I have a wonderful plan for your life and you're my husband, your wife, you're gonna eat this, you're gonna drink this, you're gonna walk 10,000 steps a day, you're gonna be like Jesus and whatever. But each one of you have to establish your own habits. And it's about your body and your mind connected to your soul and your faith. Your body and your mind connected to your soul and to your faith. There, there's a part of you that's going to live forever. I believe we're going to be able to have a body that we're going to recognize in heaven as well, too. I believe that every single person is going to be resurrected on the day when Christ comes back and some are going to go be with him forever and some are going to be eternally separated from him, not because of his choice, but because of the choice that you've made within your body. It's all connected together. And Paul makes it very specific here. The author of this, he's writing to a group of people in Rome, like the Washington DC of their day. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Hello, let's just stop right there for just a moment, all right? Um, all of life as Americans, if we listen to the advertisements, it's about us. It's about me. We, our favorite station on the radio is WIIFM. What's in it for me? Um, I, I want it my way. I want you to get it my exactly kind of way. I ran to my brother the other day at Smoothie King. We got it our way, right? We did, that's right. We got the ones we wanted. He was getting it for his kids too. He's taking care of his family. I, I want it my way. And, and there's, there's things that are certainly okay with that, right? But when I become the filter of all my existence, then I miss out on the purpose of life. It's not about me. It's not about just you. It's about us coming together. And next week, we're going to talk even more about the body of Christ. But let me stay focused for today because I keep wanting to chase that rabbit. And you know how I chase rabbits. I tell people, by the way, if you're a guest here, I'm a little bit like a cross-eyed discus thrower. That means I don't set any records, but I keep the crowd alert. <laughs> right? I'm just saying. For the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly, not to think, certainly think highly of yourself. You are you're filled with lemon, and God has built you exactly a miracle. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. By the way, this faith that God has assigned has to do with the gifts that he gives you, not just your talents, but your gifts that he gives you at the time of your salvation that are to be exercised in this world together as his body in this world for his glory. And here's how it works. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. Uh, he was a transcendentalist, which means he had some pretty weird theology. I do believe, hopefully, he was a believer, but he, some ways are a little bit out there. But he said this, and this makes complete sense. Here's how it works. You, you sow a thought. You reap in action. 
whether you pick that kind of toothpaste or you use your right hand or you eat that for lunch today, you're gonna choose to pick up something with your hand. You, you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you're gonna do your push-ups in the morning, that's great. If you're gonna do your spiritual time with God in the morning or the evening or wherever, driving down the road, if you're going to decide by your thoughts to do something with it. I love the fact that he talks about action. Uh, too many of, of us measure ourselves by our intentions. There, there's a book in the New Testament called The Acts, or The Actions, if you will, of the apostles, the people that were the first witnesses to Jesus Christ. He, he, said, he didn't say these are the intentions of the apostles. There's a lot of people that are well-meaning. Well, one day I will, or someday I'll do this, or one day I'll get around to go, you know, one year I gave a bunch of people, you always hear people say, I'm gonna do this when I get around to it. So I had this little thing printed up. It said T-U-I-T on it. I said, now you got around to it, so go do it. Put it in your pocket and remember. Remember. So a thought, reap an action. So an action. Reap a habit. There are so many great books that are out there. Get James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Get the book, The Power of Habit. There's some great things that will tell you how to do things, but essentially what it really all comes down to is little steps, big changes, one day at a time, working on a little bit at a time and making it a habit. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. People, people know you are state fans. They know. People know you're Carolina fans. They know. People know whether you're Christians. They know because your character has been demonstrated because you sowed a thought into an action, then an action into a habit, and then a habit into a character. And then finally, sow a character and reap your destiny. Man, Emerson was right on it here. He was absolutely right on it. So what do we do next then? So here's the next thing I would surround you with. So, so we know that we have a mind, we have a body, we have a soul, that they're all connected, that God has made this body as a container for our souls. And then ultimately, we have a body that's going to live forever. It's going to be recognizable. I love, I shared this a couple weeks ago about what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, a great preacher of old. He's kind of like the Billy Graham of his day or the famous, the Louis Giglio of his day or whatever. Somebody asked him, said, do you think we're going to know each other in heaven, preacher? No, actually, he lived in Britain, so they would have said, pasta, do you think we will know each other in heaven? He said, do you think we'll be dumber then? <laughs> so he's right. Hurt Spurgeon was a character. Um, smoked cigars. He's one of those kind of guys, right? One lady came to his office one day, and he was smoking a cigar and studying his Bible. By the way, I'm not a proponent. I'm not suggesting you do. It's probably not good for you. It's, it's absolutely not good for you. Or anyway, but anyway, right? And she said, Spurgeon, I see that you are smoking your idols again. He said, no, madam, just burning them. <laughs> anyway, a little useless history there for you today. But here's what happens a lot of time in the world around things like smoking, drinking, cussing, going out with those that do whatever, or politics, whether you're red or blue or purple. Don't lose your faith and don't lose your friends because you're voting on a different side of it. There's more important things in life, and Jesus is more important than that. This is that year. Don't let civil war happen in church. Let's keep peace, all right? You with me? We'll talk more about it as the year goes on, but we can talk enough about it right now. We know who's running. So there's noise about that. There's noise about the environment. There's noise about this. And, but I want to dial back in for just a moment. I want to let you know that in times like these, it's always good to know there's always been times like these because the same guy, Paul, who wrote to the Romans in the Washington, D.C. that day, also wrote to a place called Colossae. And the scripture that Ed Louis Giglio used a while ago, for by him all things were created and in everything all things consist, he was writing to the people in Colossae, to this town. It was a town like Belmont or Mount Holly or Charlotte or Gastonia or Lincolnton and some of you in India and Pakistan and the West Coast. There are all kinds of people that you guys are watching online. Thank you so much for being our, our audience. We love you. But there's noise, and here's what some of their noise is about. And you can tell by reading what he has to say. And this is not so important. The first part of the sentence, but then pay attention to the last. Let no one disqualify you. It's because people have their list. And if you don't do, they don't believe what we do, then you're not in. 
insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Here's what asceticism means. It means you're doing asceticism, means you're doing without something for a time period so that you can dedicate yourself to God. So some of you are doing Lent, which means you're doing without things for 40 days, and you're, you know, well, that's fine. But for, for, for people that want to make it public, I haven't had meat in three weeks. Oh, I'm going to die. For some people, that's what it becomes all about. How ascetic they're being in their habits. It's not about, he said, don't listen to that noise. Or the worship of angels. Oh, now that's another one. Now they're stirring some people in your grits. You got angels on your shelf, and you got angels in the outfield, and angels in the infield, and you got angels that are protecting you. And angels were never meant to be worshiped. They were to be respected and heeded, and God sent them as messengers. But angels are never to be worshiped. As a matter of fact, Jesus could have come as an angel, but it says in Hebrews chapter 1, he made himself a little bit lower than angels and was crowned with glory and honor because he was willing to become like us. And angels can't understand what it's like to have somebody redeem them like we do. So he said, don't listen to that noise. Or going on detail about visions, Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. A lot of stuff you see on TV commercials in the middle of the night is about be skinny, do this, do that, go there. All that kind of stuff is about, that's my vision for me. That's where I'm going. Like, go to places like that. Be, be skinny if that's what it is you want to do. Eat the kind of things you want to do. Make your dreams come true. But ultimately, what I'm saying to you today that every lamin and molecule in your body is designed for you to glorify the one who died on the cross for you and for me. So here's where we get to and not holding fast to the head. That's Jesus. More about the body next week. Not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Hey, listen, you can have a growth from everything else, but you want a growth that comes from God. And the growth that comes from God is always gonna be something you practice with your body, and then you're gonna put that into practice with your habits. And you, got, you have a good one or bad? Let me ask a question. How many of you have at least one habit you'd like to work on make it a lot better? For me, it's like... <laughs> and it's important to do that. By the way, how many of you have students that are part of our collision ministry? They're, raise your hand. If you're working in our collision ministry, would you raise your hand? Right, fam, students, you got students that are in that kind of stuff. Listen, it's the best Wednesday night, the best two hours of your life. Hey, listen, if you have students that are not in collision, it's date night every Wednesday night if you want to bring them, I promise. But they're not just going to be babysat. Here's the kind of things they learn. Pastor Justin shared this with me about what students learn. First, hang in with God. Spending that time with God. Accountability toward one another in relationships. Uh, doing Bible study together. I'm sorry, I'm in your way over here. <laughs> I'm pointing over this way. Involvement in church. Maybe your first serve is going to be your involvement in church besides coming to sit and to worship and, or maybe giving a gift of the Easter offering as tithing is mentioned next. And then sacraments, or we would call them ordinances, the Lord's Supper and, and baptism. And we're going to do Lord's Supper next week, by the way. So you want to be back for the Lord's Supper. That's the kind of stuff our kids are learning that adults need to learn too. And I love what uh, Pastor Justin reminds us of is that, you know, adults are just young people who buy stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> We got that from our speaker last fall, and he's can carry that into the future. Here's my, here's my formula for good habits. And incidentally, Jesus had good habits. Jesus got his 10,000 steps every day because they could not ride on enough donkeys. He got his 10,000 steps. They walked everywhere, all right? He didn't need a counter. He probably had 15 or 20,000 steps. I mean, Jesus had a good diet. We know at least that he uh, enjoyed fish and chips regularly, all right? So he's, he's eating fish, and it was probably boiled, and it probably wasn't fried, and the chips were probably uh, like unleavened bread or something like Jesus had good habits. And then Jesus spent time with people. It was a habit. He, he did that. Jesus spent time alone with God. It was a habit. But, but here is a definition where every word means something that God has given me to give to you this week. Here, here's what habits are. Habits are healthy, first of all. They're healthy. Now here, don't, don't play Satan. Did God really say you don't need to do that? What's really healthy? You know what's healthy. You know, tell, tell me the truth. Go ahead and shame the devil. You know what's healthy? You know what you should eat and not eat? You know what you should do and not do? You know what you should think and not think? You know what you should look at and look at and not look at? Don't you? Of course you do. That they're healthy actions. Healthy actions. Building. They're healthy actions. Building one upon another. Intentionally. Healthy actions. Building intentionally. 
I've got two for the T. That which is transformative from our heart, from our mind, from the inside out, and trackable. Any kind of habits you have, and you kind of habit, you, you need to follow and be trying. Again, you're going like, I wish I had some more help with this. Here's the deal. Go buy Atomic Habits by James Clear or The Power of Habit, either one of those books. If you can't afford it, send me your address. I'll buy it for you. I'm just not going to give you my address. To, no, I'm just kidding. Email pastorpoint.cc. You mentioned the book. I'll buy it for you. You're watching online. It goes for you guys too. But these are transformative steps, but they're also trackable. And then they're steps. There's a reason our mission statement is to lead people to take their next step in their journey with Christ by loving Jesus and becoming like Jesus and sharing him with others. You can love him by committing your body today. That is your spiritual service of worship, it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You can worship God. You can serve God and take a step with him by saying, I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to fill it with the good and the clean and the powerful and the positive. I'm going to take time for what it is that God wants to do in my life. I'm going to, I'm going to share what it is that is my life and how my, my life is tied together. Hey, man, I'm going to tell you, I, I just can't even look at my hands anymore without seeing millions of crosses, millions of lamina molecules that are forming my body. You want to become more like Christ, then you got to listen to what he says. Spend time talking to him and then shutting up a little while so he can talk to you back. God was challenging me to do something this week. And I won't go into all the details and that kind of stuff, but I'll just tell you this. He, he told me when to do it. And I was like, eh, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and then the pressure builds. When I finally did it, it was like, man, I'm so glad I did that. Good habit will take you there. So what today? Begin the habits of your body with your body. Just answer that. Tell them I'm still talking. <laughs> Ask them why they're not in church or watching online. See, you guys get credit to you're watching online. We ain't forgot about you, I promise. Begin the habits with your body that will transform your life. I'm going to ask you something. How many of you are going to start one? You know what you should do. Would you raise your hand? I'm going to start one too. I'm going to tell you what it is in the next couple weeks. I'm going to get the courage, but first I got to tell my wife. I got to make sure to get permission for this. I got a bad habit. I need to turn to transform into a good one. But ultimately, now what? Commit your body to Jesus and its habits to change your life. It begins with him. And in both of our services this morning, in person, online, there are people that heard and considered the claims of Christ. And like many of you, or most of you perhaps have already done, they gave their life to Christ. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and hearts in prayer. Everybody in the room, if you're watching online, we invite you to do so too if it's safe. If you're driving down the road, do not bow your head while you're driving, but listen. Today, if you've heard God's voice and you know that he has been knocking on the door of your heart and trying to get your attention and to let you know it's not about you, it's about him, but he loves you so much that he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Are you going to keep being that way? Are you going to be somebody else's? Are you going to be his? You're either his and I'm pointing upward or you're his and I'm pointing southward. There's no in-between. If you say, I'm kind of in-between, you're really his because he's convinced you that you don't have to do this. But today, if you're hearing God knock upon your heart and you say, I want to give him my body, I'm going to challenge you to do so right now. And then to take a step to let me welcome you into God's kingdom. I invite you, those of you that know him already, and there, there are people in front of you and behind you and besides you and people watching online and people at the front of the room and people at the back of the room. They need Jesus and Jesus. Pray them into heaven. Pray them into God's family right now. Would you, would you do so? God's going to do a miraculous work right now. And today, if you're in this room, you're going like, man, I get it. I need to give my life to Christ. I need him to transform my life and my heart and my soul and my strength. I'm going to invite you to do this. I'm going to say, I'm going to encourage you to repeat after me in person, no line. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. I give you my life. 
I'm following you now. Help me to know you more and give me a family to come around me.